good evening, everybody. My name is Charlene Margo, and I am the co-founder of The Parent Venture, a nonprofit organization that partners with Peninsula Healthcare District to bring you tonight's program from the Parent Education Series. We are so delighted to have you here tonight with us for a very important topic. I don't like needles supporting kids with vaccine anxiety. Um, we could not be more delighted to have with us presenters, Dr. Julie Lustig and Dr. Kellen Glinder. And we are especially grateful to tonight's sponsor, Peninsula Healthcare District. CEO Cheryl Fama could not be with us tonight, but Ann Wasson, their community outreach director, is with us. So again, many thanks to Peninsula Healthcare District for sponsoring tonight's town hall. If you would like Spanish interpretation, we have with us Luis Romero, who will be providing Spanish. There are instructions in the chat if you click on the chat button, or there is also a logo at the bottom, interpretation globe, you can click on the globe, and then Espanol. All right. Uh, just a little bit more about tonight's format. Well, actually, before we go into format, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Lawrence Capel, who is the board chair at Peninsula Healthcare Districts, for some welcoming remarks. Lawrence, please take it away. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, again, I'm uh, Larry Capel. I'm the board chair of the Peninsula Healthcare District, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I'm really excited about tonight's uh, topic. When the topic first uh, came up to me, I thought, eh, I wasn't all that interested. But the more I did my own research, I think this is an absolutely wonderful topic uh, for us, and, and especially at this point uh, in our country's history. Uh, the Peninsula Healthcare District's vision is that all of our residents achieve their optimal health uh, through prevention, education, and access to medical, dental, uh, and uh, mental health services. The evening, this evening's program is an example of that. Um, we've had a long-standing track record of providing these educational programs, and uh, I think they're important because they contribute to the healthcare liter the literacy, and we're trying to raise that level of literacy around the area, especially within our district. These programs will help our community make informed healthcare decisions to prevent illness, promote their health, and the health of their families. Tonight, we're here because you have questions. Uh, this is your opportunity to ask us anything, anything that uh, you are thinking about. Give us, give us a shout and uh, we'll do our best to answer it the best we can. We want you to leave here tonight better informed and hopefully with the confidence to vaccinate your children and teens together and only together can we beat this pandemic. Charlene? Thank you so much, Chair Larry Capel, for those inspiring remarks. We are really, as Larry said, delighted to be partnering with the Peninsula Healthcare District to bring these kinds of educational events, especially to parents, caregivers, and community members. And tonight is really a special one. Dr. Julie Lustig, who you're gonna be hearing from tonight, actually emailed us after the last town hall on children and vaccines and said, you know, I have this initiative at Stanford and it might be of interest. So Julie's gonna be talking to you about that shortly. Before we get going, just a few comments about the logistics for tonight. Most of you by now are probably familiar with Zoom, but this is a meeting format. So you attendees can communicate with us and interact with us via the chat button. My co-founder Bev Hartman will be putting resource links in the chat, but do feel free to put your questions in there and we will add those into the end of our program where we wanna hear from you, the Q&A. So we'll start out with comments from Dr. Lustig and Dr. Glender, and then we're gonna open up the floor. This is again a town hall meeting. So we really do wanna hear your thoughts and questions. And the place to do that is the chat button. In the chat, you can also send messages to us, the panelists, or tonight's presenters. So feel free to do that as well. Uh, at the end, there'll be a link to a very short survey, like one minute. I hope you'll take a second to fill that out. It helps us improve what we do and also plan for future parent education and parent venture foundation projects. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenters. Dr. Julie Lustig is a licensed psychologist in the San Francisco Bay Area Peninsula with over 25 years of experience. And she's adjunct faculty at Stanford University School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. After obtaining her doctorate in psychology, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University in public health. Dr. Lustig specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, for children, adolescents, and young adults. 
As a past research faculty member in the Department of Pediatrics at UCSF, she led the development of a training program for pediatricians to improve adolescent health services. She recently partnered with Dr. Jocelyn C on the I Don't Like Needles initiative to address needle fear and, fear and phobia in children and teens. Welcome, Dr. Lustig. Next, we will hear from Dr. Kellen Glinder. Dr. Glinder has been a prominent pediatrician in Silicon Valley for nearly two decades, including leading the pediatric department of the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Palo Alto. He is currently an adjunct clinical assistant professor at Stanford's Children's Hospital and is in practice with private medical. He is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy and Immunology, and the Wilderness Medicine Society. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for Dr. Julie Lustig and Dr. Kellen Glinder. Julie, let's start with you. Please take it away. Hi, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Charlene. And thank you to the Peninsula Healthcare District and Dr. Lawrence Kapow to the Parent Education Series and to the Parent Venture for inviting me to st speak today about this very important and very, very timely topic, uh, needle fear in kids. I am going to try now to um, share my screen. Let's see. Okay, let's see, there we go. And um, I'm going to present some slides in just a moment. Um, and uh, hopefully you will be able to see them on your screen as well. There we go. Um, and here they should be loading. There we are. Hopefully that you can see those. So, um, so I'm thrilled to be able to present today with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Kellen McClender, um, about this important topic. Um, I'm so pleased that he, he took time out of his, his very busy pediatrician schedule to, to be here with me. Um, so managing kids' needle fear is extremely challenging for parents. And not only for parents, um, but for the medical providers, for the kids, for the staff. Um, it's a very high pressure, uh, stressful, you know, time sensitive um, public situation that's, that's really quite difficult for everyone involved. And there's no one to blame. Um, it's just one of those situations that, that's challenging. The way that we approach needle fear is actually counterintuitive. It's really not what we would do naturally as parents, which is one of the reasons I think it's so difficult to address. Um, it, I'm going to just tell a little story that might sound familiar to some of you. Um, this is a story about a child I'll call Anna and her mom. Um, and uh, Anna, it's time for her to get her COVID-19 vaccine. So Anna's mom picks her up from school and announces, today you get your vaccine with enthusiasm. Anna bursts into tears and her mom reassures her that it's not going to hurt and she'll buy her ice cream afterwards. Um, but Anna is still terrified. Um, they get in the car anyway and drive to the clinic. Um, they wait for their turn. And when they go in and it's finally Anna's turn, she sits down in the chair and she screams out, I can't do it, I don't like needles. So the medical assistant tries to reassure her. Anna's mom tries to calm her. Anna stands up, pulls her arm away and says, I'm not getting the vaccine, there's no way. Mom and Anna leave the clinic disheartened with no plan and no idea what to do next. Unfortunately, this is an all too common experience for parents of kids with needle fear. And again, there's no one to blame. If this sounds familiar, um, Dr. Glinder and I are here today to tell you you are not alone. Um, we are here hopefully to give you some ideas about how to manage this situation and, and a lot of resources to help you so that if you do want to get your child vaccinated, you'll be able to do that. So I'm just going to give a little background. You know, what is needle fear and phobia? It's one of the reasons, again, it's difficult to address is because it's, it's quite irrational. Um, and kids often know that their fear is irrational and not logical. Um, in a part of their brain, they know that needles and injections are safe and really maybe don't hurt that much. But in another part of their brain, that fear response gets triggered. 
And what happens when that gets triggered is an automatic fight or flight response. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, if we think about it, when that gets triggered, that your child might fight as in kick, scream, hit the provider, bite maybe, um, or flight, run away, um, hide, avoid, um, get out or you know, leap out of the chair. But these are actually normal automatic responses that your child's body is activating to try to protect them from perceived danger. That fight or flight response, which some of you may know, evolved millions of years ago to protect us from actual life-threatening dangers. But in modern times, what happens is that emotional part of our brain mistakes a needle for something that's perceived as dangerous and life-threatening. And so the brain signals to the body that there's a danger. We sometimes call that a false alarm. And our bodies respond as though there is a life-threatening danger with that urge to fight or flight and all the physical changes that go with it, such as rapid heartbeat, rapid and shallow breathing, sometimes nausea, sometimes tight muscles, and more. When the fear is more extreme, it can become an actual phobia, and we call this phobia trypanophobia. Um, and for some kids, um, rather than the fight or flight response, what, what they experience is a rapid drop in blood pressure and a faint feeling, and many actually faint, and adults can faint as well, just even at the sight of the needle. And Dr. Glinder can explain that medically a little bit more. So why is this so important? Well, managing needle fear um, is extremely important because kids who are fearful of needles avoid important things like vaccinations. And of course, right now, it's extremely important that kids get vaccinated. And because this particular um, vaccine requires two and now even three doses, that first experience is extremely important. If they have a negative experience the first time and don't want, and even if they get vaccinated, they may not want to go back for the second dose and then the booster. So it's quite important for us to make sure that that initial experience is as positive as possible. In addition, kids who are fearful of needles can start to avoid important medical tests, procedures, and actually important medical care as a child and even on into adulthood. Um, so we know that managing needles uh, it can help kids build a sense of mastery and control over not only the fear of needles, but other fears as well. Well, how common is this? I think some may be surprised to hear that approximately 63% of children and teens fear needles. The vast majority, the majority of, of kids are afraid of needles. And as much as 20% have an actual phobia. So about one in five kids may have an actual needle phobia. Um, clearly it's very common and there's no need for kids or parents to be embarrassed about this. Um, I, I work with kids who are athletes and courageous and adventurous and confident and wonderful students and terrified of a needle. Um, and similarly, parents uh, don't need to think that it's any reflection on them. It's not a reflection of weakness in parents or um, any, anything negative necessarily. It really is just this irrational fear that is actually very, very common. Um, what causes needle fear? Um, well, we know that it's a combination of genetics and life events. So there's a hereditary component, meaning it, it's common among family members. And in one study, approximately 80% of people with um, needle fear reported that an immediate family member also had that fear. Um, it can occur uh, as a result of a negative or traumatic experience with needles. My colleague who works with adults finds that a lot of the adults she sees actually had a, a traumatic or negative experience with needles as a child, maybe at a dentist or in another setting. Um, kids who, who faint can um, have that experience and then be fearful of fainting in the future. Um, sometimes needles are associated with something negative like maybe a surgery or, or some other um, experience that someone's had that's negative. And then finally, how parents react to the child's fear can make a difference. Um, positive coping and um, modeling calm, 
courageous, confident behavior uh, uh, for parents can actually be quite helpful. So what can parents do? Uh, there's actually a lot they can do, and I just am going to highlight a few strategies here. Um, uh, there's a slide at the end that I think Charlene can share with you that has resources, and on those I have a, a list of, of many wonderful resources, and within those all kinds of worksheets and handouts on coping strategies. Um, so that slide is should the material on that can be made available to you. Um, the things I'm going to talk about are more for kids with um, mild fear, not necessarily phobia. One of the first things is you can find out what is your child specifically afraid of? So are they just fearful of seeing the needles? Are they afraid it might hurt, which is a very common fear? Um, are they afraid they'll lose control? Are they afraid of fainting, um, that something bad might happen, that someone something might mess up when they give the vaccine? Um, find out what, what they're specifically afraid of. And then let your child know it's okay to be afraid. You know, really, I don't think I know anyone who likes needles. Um, and so many people are fearful of them and that's okay. And the goal isn't actually to love needles or to even not be afraid. It's really just to manage that fear enough to be able to get vaccinated in this case. Um, we can teach kids uh, strategies such as, um, I'll go into a few of them, breathing, techniques, distraction, learning how to face their fears. Um, Dr. Glinder is going to talk about some strategies um, that we can use for, specifically for kids who faint. One is called applied tension, um, and he'll, he'll go into that a little bit. Um, so, and find out why your child might want to get vaccinated. What's in it for them? So perhaps your child will get to do sleepovers after that, or maybe um, hug a relative or see a relative they haven't been able to see. Maybe they'll be able to travel again or go to movies. See if your child has some incentive to, to get vaccinated. Um, there's something we call a travel, uh, I'm sorry, a, a comfort plan, which is very important. You can create a plan with your child to prepare for the vaccine. So unlike Anna in the story, who was really caught off her guard and kind of blindsided, it's much better even with younger kids to let them know at least a little bit in advance so they can prepare and um, have a sense of control over the, the process. Um, be honest, let them know, yes, it does hurt a little bit like a little pinch and their arm might be a little sore and they might not feel well. It's much better to be honest so that kids trust what you say. Um, and help your child advocate. Um, Dr. Glenda can speak to this as well. Kids can ask for to lie down if they'd like when they get it or to sit up. There are pain management strategies that again, Dr. Glenda can go into in more detail such as um, numbing creams and vibration strategies that can actually help a lot with the pain and they can learn that they could ask for those. Um, so advocating and collaborating with the healthcare providers can be very helpful. Um, as I mentioned, how parents react to kids' fears, it plays an important role. So you can model calm and healthy coping. Um, finally, if the fears are, are severe or at a phobia level, you may might want to consider getting professional help um, from what we call a cognitive behavioral therapist or CBT therapist who specializes in, in phobias in anywhere from four or five to about 15 hours or more, a child can learn how to um, address this even at a phobic level, but you may need some professional guidance. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about a few of the strategies. Um, you may be familiar with some of these. Um, one that can be quite helpful is called belly breathing. It's or diaphragmatic breathing. It's where kids learn to um, breathe in through their nose, inhale through their nose and expand their belly. I talk about inhaling as though you're smelling flowers, expand your belly like you're blowing up a balloon in your belly and then pause and count to five and then slowly breathe out through their mouth like they're blowing out birthday candles. That kind of calming breathing can be very helpful, especially if they practice it over time. We also know that particularly for needles, distraction can be very helpful. Kids can bring um, a stuffed animal, a doll, um, 
Older kids and teens can bring a phone, listen to music, watch a funny video. Parents can sit by their kids and talk to them about something maybe they're looking forward to. There are many, many ways to distract kids. Sometimes people will use bubbles. Kids can blow bubbles or parents can blow bubbles um, for the younger children as ways to, to distract them while the uh, vaccine's occurring. One of the most powerful strategies is something we call exposure or facing your fears. Um, again, for mild fears, this is something parents can try to do with their kids. For more severe fears and phobia, you might need some, some professional guidance on it. But this is the part that I was talking about that's a bit counterintuitive. When our kids are scared, we tend to, um, they, they avoid, and we tend to reinforce that by perhaps maybe not letting them see images of needles or uh, videos of needles because it's so frightening. The way that we treat this is actually the opposite. We want to expose kids to needles, but very gradually, one small step at a time, and in a way where, that the child feels in control. So for example, um, you can list a number of activities, and I use a scale of say one to 10, with one being the easiest, five about in the middle, and 10 being really difficult. So for example, for one child, maybe a one is saying the word needle, very easy. A five might be watching a video of someone getting vaccinated, and then a 10 might be actually going and getting their own vaccination. Um, what they can do is list these activities and then start practicing them one by one by one. So, and I have some samples of this on the website. Um, one example of a child's um, list might be starting with one again, saying the word needle, maybe looking at a cartoon picture of a needle and then a real picture, then looking at a cartoon um, image of someone getting vaccinated and then maybe a real person getting vaccinated. And then the next level is actually pretend practicing giving vaccines. You can buy little pretend syringes or you can actually buy syringes with no needles. You don't use real needles, but just the syringe part, even um, little toy ones. And kids of all ages can learn to practice giving them to their dolls, their stuffed animals, their siblings, their parents. And then parents similarly can practice giving it to a child if they're Julie, I accidentally muted you. Can you unmute? There you go. There we go. Okay. My bad. Sorry. No problem. Okay. So, um, so another way to practice is to do kind of a dress rehearsal or a dry run. Yeah, um, let me put the I think somebody, somebody else is unmuted. Um, so you can um, do a pretend visit to the clinic to get vaccinated where you get in the car and you go and you walk in and you do everything except getting the vaccine, just again, to get the child used to it. When you're practicing, if you do practice this at home with pretend syringe giving vaccines, the more realistic it is, the better. So you can try to use all your senses, have some alcohol so the child can smell the alcohol, have some band-aids handy, you can rub the alcohol on the arm, put the Band-Aid on, maybe have some sanitizer so they get familiar with that smell. You can use all the senses to make it as realistic as possible. And finally, this doesn't have to be a, a, a serious, heavy experience, even though the child is, is, finds this scary. You can make it fun and playful and creative. And um, that does help retrain the brain to, to see that this is actually not a life-threatening, dangerous situation. It can kind of change the emotional experience. Oops, let's see. So I, I mentioned, um, I mentioned these a comfort plan. They're all different kinds. And again, on the website, we have some for younger children and some for older kids and teens. I developed one more for older kids and teens, but it could be adapted for younger kids. Um, and, the, and PAMF is uh, working with me, collaborating with me, um, some of the staff there to develop this perhaps for other ages. And it's called Prepared. 
And each of the letters stands for a strategy um, that I've talked about today. So the prepared game plan is a plan where kids can actually fill out a form that writes down all the things that they can do to prepare for getting vaccinated. So psychoeducate would be, what are some of the things the child has learned about fear and how to respond to fear? Relax can be some of those st strategies I mentioned, the belly breathing or other techniques. Expose, as I talked about, exposure is facing their fears and so they can write down how they're going to do that. Practice, the more they practice, the more repetition and preparing for vaccination, the better. Ask, they can write down the questions that they wanna ask their provider or their parents. I didn't talk as much about rewards, but the child can write down what's rewarding about the vaccine for themselves. And we do recommend giving a child a small reward for getting vaccinated. Um, it's not necessary, but it can be helpful. And it's better to do it in advance as part of the plan than right at that moment when a child is struggling to, to throw out the offer of a reward. It's much better for them to know ahead of time that there might be something nice and it can be like an ice cream or something small, but just some reward to acknowledge their effort. Easing the stress uh, refers to the strategies that the child can use at home to feel a sense of control. So maybe thinking about what they're going to wear, um, maybe bringing their favorite stuffed animal, think, asking, um, thinking about who's going to join them and where they want that person to sit, what kinds of distractions do they want to bring? And then finally, um, D for distract. And that's what we went over a little while ago with all the different strategies for distracting. So in summary, a few takeaways is that needle fear leads to fight or flight and avoidance, but it is very treatable. There's a lot that parents can do to help their kids face their fears. And if it is at the level of a severe fear of phobia, um, professional help uh, can just give you some of that guidance to, to do this at home. And finally, um, it can be very, very helpful to create one of these comfort plans or game plans so that your child can feel, feel a sense of control and can be prepared. So um, this last slide is the one I mentioned that I think Charlene can um, make available to you or get this information to you. And if not, I can do that. And then I just have a number of references if anyone is interested on articles and various resources that I used for this talk today. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I am going to hand it back to Charlene and then I think Dr. Glender is going to speak. Thank you so much, Dr. Lustig for all of that amazing information. You've given us a lot of new things to think about. Really fantastic. Um, all right, we're next gonna hand it over to Dr. Kellen Glinder who is a leader of the pediatric department at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Palo Alto and adjunct clinical assistant professor at Stanford Children's Health. Take it away, Dr. Glinder. Thank you very much, Charlene. Thank you, Dr. Lustig, for that uh, wonderful overview and uh, deployment of strategies. This is a, a well-needed topic. Um, thank you, Dr. Capel. Thank you, Charlene, for inviting us here to speak about this. A busy pediatrician in today's world uh, and their team will probably give about 5,000 vaccines a year, 5,000 single shots a year. And as Dr. Lustig mentioned, it's not really anybody's fault. It's sort of how the system is designed. It's very difficult for a medical team and a busy practice, a usual busy practice, to actually spend more than 30, 60 seconds um, preparing a child for a vaccine. So plenty of us have had children or have had fears ourselves or continue to have fears. And unfortunately, the work uh, to work on that actually falls mostly on parents. And there's not a lot of resources out there for parents to, to help. So just if, I just wanna cover a few of the basics to set the context up so that when anyone's thinking about deploying Dr. Lustig's strategies, they can kind of understand the milieu that this runs into. So the needles that are used in the area that the needles often go into actually usually cause very little pain. And the pain will vary mostly based on the ingredients of the injection. 
So for instance, most of us know that a tetanus shot hurts. A tetanus shot will almost always hurt everybody that goes into, but a hepatitis A shot usually won't hurt. And we've all probably had shots that we've gotten as adults where, wow, I didn't feel that at all. And some of the concoctions in the needles actually hurts less than others. And that's, it's important to know, it's not so important to a kid who's afraid, but to Julie's point, identifying what kids are actually afraid of can help. And I never like to tell people it's not gonna hurt. <laughs> It may not have hurt me. <laughs> I have no ability to judge somebody else's pain. And I think just acknowledging that, acknowledging that parents do painful things and they move through it, that kids too can do painful things and they move through it. And oftentimes kids do painful things all the time and they don't even think about it. They fall and skin their knee at kickball and they're so excited to run to first base that they just run right through the pain. So in many instances, kids are used to dealing with pain. And so acknowledging some of that is helpful, as Dr. Lustig has pointed out. There are many things to do to interfere with the pain. And some of the specifics that Dr. Lustig alluded to are mainly interacting with the transmission, the, the neurological transmission of that pain signal from your deltoid or your shoulder up to your brain where you actually process it. When we're doing a lot of procedures that are not shots, there's some topical numbing cream that can help. The topical numbing cream really just helps with the actual poke in the skin. Injections have such a thin needle that often that doesn't help. That, uh, that numbing cream helps with a larger needle, like if we're doing a blood draw or a procedure or something like that. That's a prescription and can be um, requested from your pediatrician or family practice doctor ahead of time and give it, you can get some instructions about how to put it on. The other ways that are really effective in the moment for dealing with injection pain are vibration. Your body prioritizes the sense of vibration over pain. So if you have anything that actually um, causes vibration or vigorous rubbing that doesn't interfere with the placement of the needle, those things can help a lot. This is similar if you bump your head, my grandmother always used to say, rub it. And it's true, you, you can rub it and you don't feel the pain as much. As soon as you stop rubbing it, your bump is still there though. So you'll notice a lot of nurses will squeeze like this. And if they move around, they're trying to create more of these interfering signals so that it masks the pain. There's something called a buzzy bee that you can put up here and it causes vibration. That's all very helpful. And uh, a lot of people, this, I have to address this, a lot of people say, well, I'll just take Tylenol ahead of time. And that actually is rarely effective. It doesn't work for this type of pain, this type of sudden acute pain with the injections. It does help with post-injection pain. So Tylenol is really helpful if you're going to get muscle aches after your influenza shot or after your COVID booster. Those usually take a number of hours to set up after you get the injection. And by that time, the Tylenol that you took beforehand wears off. So there is some data, that this has not been done with COVID, but with other vaccines, there's some data that actually the vaccines are slightly less effective if you're actually getting them administered while you're on Tylenol or ibuprofen. It's very, very mild. But what we would recommend is trying to do it without it and then be prepared afterwards if you have any side effects, you have a sore arm or anything like that, absolutely use some Tylenol or ibuprofen. The, the undercurrent here that I really want to address as well is this idea that there's shame involved in being needle phobic. And I think that that just gets in the way. Unfortunately, we all feel it. It's in our environment. I've felt it. One of my strongest childhood memories is running out of the laboratory at two and a half through a strip mall parking lot and hiding in the car. It's indelibly placed in my mind because I was so terrified at the time and those things kind of can carry forward for a long period of time. I've seen tiny, tiny little adolescents just be completely stoic in their vaccines. And I've seen 300 pound adolescent football players pass out cold as soon as the needle comes in the room. A lot of this is visceral and reflexive and doesn't really 
tell you anything about the character of that individual. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time in those situations just reassuring people, like your body is going to have its response. And while there are things that you can do, just acknowledging that fear, like Dr. Lustig said, and acknowledging those vulnerabilities and moving on, figuring out what you can do about those own vulnerabilities that you have is really where the measure of somebody's personality comes in. Yes, I pass out, but I am going to take care of that. I'm going to do something about that. I still want this vaccine. That, that really shows some fortitude. One thing that, uh, that happens is passing out. And if you think that you get woozy, you, your child gets lightheaded, it's better to just be proactive about that. Almost every pediatric vaccine has a, has a method to deliver the vaccines while kids are laying down. And that way, if they pass out, they might not even notice. It's much better to just pass out while you're already horizontal. What's happening in those times is if your blood pressure drops suddenly, remember your heart's down here pumping blood up here. So if your blood pressure drops, actually your brain loses some perfusion momentarily. And your body says, uh-oh, we need to get blood back in the brain. So you go from being upright to horizontal to return that blood pressure to your brain. So if that kind of reaction is happening to you, don't fight it. <laughs> there are ways, Dr. Lustig men, uh, mentioned this applied tension, which is what pilots do actually when they do loop-de-loops, the fighter pilots do loop-de-loops. They do short breaths and mu muscle tension <clears throat> uh, like that. And they kind of bear down. That can increase the blood pressure and prevent it from happening, but it's much better to just lay down if, it's, if, if you're worried. There's no shame in that. And that's really the message I want to get across. Like if you're afraid, it's okay. If you pass out, it's A-OK. -okay. And th that leads to my last point that I want to make is with all of our children, if we don't respect their fear, we run the risk of amplifying that fear by forcing them through it. If we can acknowledge their fear and work with them on it and give them mastery, then we can reward whatever degree of mastery they exhibit. But if we just force kids through it, we run the risk of flooding them so entirely that we set them up for problems later on. We want our kids to be a certain way and our kids are gonna be the way that they are. <laughs> and acknowledging that reality can be really helpful and it can be a helpful bonding situation for a kid to actually know that no matter what, my parent has my back and they're really looking out for my long-term health and they respect who I am. And that process starts when they're very, very little. So uh, that was pretty much all I wanted to cover. If, if there are any other topics, I'm happy to jump in and, and pipe in. But I, I do want to save some time for questions. And I'll send it back to Charlene, I think, for some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Glender. That was so helpful. I love your idea about rewarding mastery for our kids. That's just a great thing. Dr. Lustig mentioned the same thing, how... This could actually, if you can help your kids master the fear, that will be good for them moving forward for the rest of their life, right? Um, we have had a presenter come, Deborah Farmer Chris, who is a journalist and educator. And she always says, ask your kid if they can be brave for 30 seconds. Can you be brave for 30 seconds? And I kind of really love that because a lot of kids think, yeah, I could do that. I could do that, right? Doesn't even have to be a minute, just start with 30 seconds. Okay, so we have some practical questions from parents. Let's just get started. Here's a good one. I think this is really important. Parent says, I read that you can't hold your child on your lap face to face. Um, do you find that helpful? Will pediatricians allow that? Well, I guess I'm, I'm reluctant to say in absolute terms what can happen in a pediatrician office. There are definitely architectural and, and logistical constraints all over in the world that may dictate one way or another. But a, a great way to actually deliver vaccines is to actually have a, a kid being held and hugged by their parent where they feel nice and secure. And uh, if they want to look in the eyes, they can look in the eyes. Oftentimes, I find children want to actually just put their head on their kid, on their mother's or father's shoulder. But I, I would say, talk to your pediatrician about that. And 
you know, in this day and age, it can be hard to access a pediatrician. You could even write them a message, like an online message about this is how my child has expressed that, that, that he or she wants to get a vaccine. Can we make a plan so that I can do this? Or how, what do I need to do? What steps do I need to do so that we can do this on Wednesday at our appointment? Okay, good advice. So I'm not sure if this question is actually for the Dr. Lustig or Dr. Dr. Glinder, but this parent asks, do you have a suggestion whether it's better to get kids vaccinated at their regular doctor's office, a drive-through clinic, or our local pharmacy? Um, maybe Dr. Glinder can start. I, I have some thoughts too, but Dr. Glinder, why don't you go? Yeah, first? well, it depends on age. I mean, you know, I think if a 17-year-old who's driving home from you know, his high school sports practice wants to uh, have his parents sign a consent form and come in and get a drive-by shot or a, a pharmacy shot, um, that's okay. But I, I, I'm partial to the vaccines in the pediatrician's office. There's just a whole lot more resources available to help should something happen. There's a lot more expertise should a, a medical question come up. And hopefully, not always, but hopefully, uh, that that child's been to that office enough where they've had enough good interactions with the staff that actually those are people that they trust. Now, I'm sure, Julie, I'm sure you, you would, you, you could say the opposite too. If there's been a traumatic situation, it might be good to, to change venue. But yeah, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree. I think they, um, there's less control, I think, at a, at a pharmacy um, where you really don't know who will be administering it and it's very public. Um, I think it's much more difficult to come in with your comfort plan and specify how you want it to go. Um, so I do agree with Dr. Glender. I think going to your pediatrician even, and maybe especially if you've had a negative experience, to try to, to change that and really advocate and try to, to um, create a more positive experience. I know some of the drive-throughs actually do, I think, a pretty good job trying to be sensitive to these things, but it's, um, as, as Dr. Glinder was talking about, just the, the numbers are so high and the cars are just coming through. And so if a child is struggling in that situation, I think it could be difficult. So for kids, I think, who are fearful, I do recommend going to their pediatrician's office if, if at all possible. All right, fair enough. I felt pretty secure sitting in my car and just sticking my arm out, but I wasn't sure how that would be if I was six. <laughs> Dr. Lustig, do you recommend that a child of any age have a prepare plan? Um, do you think it matters more for younger kids? I mean, do you recommend, what we don't know with these COVID vaccines is how many shots kids are gonna get, right? Do we know that they're gonna need boosters? I know that I'm asking a few questions at once, but. Do you have some suggestions around that? Should parents always have a prepare plan with their kids who are getting vaccines? I think it, that they can be useful for any age. Um, on the website, I refer to um, a foundation called the Meg Foundation for Pain, where they have some examples of, of uh, visual comfort plans for, for younger kids. And um, it, certainly if the child does, is fearless and, and has no concerns about it, it may not be necessary, but, um, but there are some that are more visual for very young children and then others that um, can be used for elementary school and teens. So um, it, we don't know for sure how many vaccines they'll get, but I think having a plan um, can give, give the child a sense of control. And also I think, Dr. Glender might be able to speak to this, but um, learning to be a, a self-advocate in your own health care at a young age, I, I think can be so positive. And so it's kind of an opportunity really in that regard. I think that's an important point. My uh, Parent Venture co-founder, Bev Hartman was mentioning that her own daughter was so fearful and resistant to vaccines when she was young. And now she's a medical assistant at Stanford who gives shots. So you never know. A, a child can develop into somebody who leads into that as a career choice. What about um, Dr. Glinder? Uh, you mentioned some really good techniques for 
helping with the pain of the actual injection, whether it is something like a pain relieving topical medication or a shot blocker like Bionix. Do parents have to request that in advance? As you say, a pediatrician's office is a busy place. You're giving 5,000 shots a year. As a parent, I always kind of felt rushed. What do you recommend? How do you recommend parents handle that kind of request? Yeah, this, this is a very uh, timely topic now because not only is it difficult to get your pediatric team on the phone or online, we went for a while with nobody wanting to come into the office and it being difficult to come in the office. Now we're all behind masks and sometimes visors and the difficulties to connect can be profound. So actually leveraging time to your benefit is helpful. The time in, in many doctor's visits, the time constraint is really the time that you're there present, not necessarily how much time you spend contacting your medical team. So you could do something over multiple appointments, or you could write things down. I think it's very helpful for a medical team to actually have something written down beforehand. My child has some needle phobia. I want to talk tomorrow about bionics, which is a shot blocker. It's a little piece of plastic with little kind of prongs on it, or the buzzy bee. Um, those sort of pre-notifications that you want to have that kind of conversation will help the physician and the physician's team set the agenda for the visit with you, collaboratively with you, rather than just the agenda for the visit running away and then the team being ready to leave and your needs not having been met. So setting that agenda collaboratively at the beginning is probably the most important thing and recognizing you can always come back. It does take time to do that. Um, having trust in your in your pediatrician to actually say some of the more vulnerable and most important things to set that agenda it's really important because you want to set it at the beginning you don't want to come out with the biggest request you have 10 seconds before the visit's over so that's going to be a lot harder to deal with if you've spent 10 minutes dealing with other things that aren't really as important right what about combining vaccines i've heard that the COVID vaccine should be given separately from others, or is that not true? At the beginning, we didn't know, and now it's you can combine them with other vaccines for sure. Yeah. When you actually look at the data on this, the, the, the difference in the pain experience, I don't mean necessarily just the injection itself, but the, the whole experience of getting immunized or getting multiple shots, the difference between zero and one is quite profound, obviously. The difference in experience between getting one or two is actually small. It's measurable, but it's small. And there are all kinds of different metrics you can use to look at that. You can look at stress hormone levels, blood pressure differences. Um, volume of screaming is one that I find particularly problematic that people have measured, but that is one that's in the literature. Yikes. But the difference between two and six vaccines given simultaneously is absolutely negligible. And so this idea that these things hurt and they're somewhat traumatic, so we're gonna do one and then next week do one and next week do another, that really trains the child that when they come into the office, something bad is gonna happen. And you know, if they're phobic, you can use that as actually exposure like Dr. Lustig is talking about, but somebody who's not phobic actually will be less traumatized usually by getting more at the same time and then having more visits that don't have anything that hurts, having any painful experience. That is so interesting. <laughs> Dr. Lustig, let's switch to the emotional aspect of this for a minute. As Dr. Glinder mentioned, a lot of this preparation for vaccines falls to parents because pediatrician offices are busy, therapists are busy. Um, Dr. Stixrude and Ned Johnson who wrote uh, the self-driven child and what do you say, talk about parents really needing to be a non-anxious presence. Can you speak to that a little bit about how parental emotions can be catching and what we as parents can do to help prepare our kids? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Charlene. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, parent modeling is extremely important. There, there's um, a lot of research out there uh, that shows how important it is um, for parents to model 
the kind of behavior they, they want to see in their kids. So when a child is scared, fearful, anxious, um, the more the parent can try to remain calm, which I'm a parent and I know that that is extremely difficult in the face of a highly anxious, scared child, but even just modeling, you know, I'm going to take a deep breath as a parent because I'm feeling uncomfortable and modeling that for your child, trying to stay calm and trying to impart to your child that, um, that sense of confidence that you know that over time they will be able to do this and that it's not life-threatening even though they feel that way and they're very scared so that parents can validate that fear and convey a sense of confidence and um, calm uh, that they can work through that together with their child and get them to, to a point where they, they can get vaccinated. Kids look to parents and listen to parents um, and those nonverbal and verbal messages are so powerful and so important. And so the more the parent can work on his or her own or their anxiety, um, the more helpful it is to the child. I think that's great advice. In her new book, Brene Brown writes about how parents need to model the kind of adult we want our kids to be in the world. And I think that is a nice piece of advice, right? Easier said than done. Right. but a good piece of advice. Um, what about vaccine clinics at schools? I was thinking that that could be a good thing, but peer pressure could also make that a tricky thing. Do you have any input on that? Depends on the child. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, uh, you know, if, if a child is motivated to get their kindergarten vaccines, the, their bundle of kindergarten vaccines, uh, in concert with one, you know, a super peer or with a friend, where there's a little bit more um, possibility for embarrassment if they were to make a big scene about resisting, that could be a very powerful way for a kid to move through that independently, because they want to be they want to be seen as masterful with this difficult skill. And it provides very little need for the parents to incentivize that situation. Rather, you can just congratulate them that they manage it very well. At the same time, if somebody does spiral, we want to really insulate them from any shame or embarrassment about not being able to do that. You know, part of parenting is looking out for what's going to happen and to try to set up the environment for success. So if you have a kid who you know is fearful, very fearful of vaccines, that's not a child that should be vaccinated in a public setting. You should yeah. really kind of look to protect that child. If you have a, a showboat, you have a child that's very eager to demonstrate mastery, somebody who's always going to be on stage or something, that child actually may benefit from doing it in a public sphere. That's true. My kids love medical procedures, but I don't think that's super typical. Um, here's a really good question from a parent. I'm not sure who this is for, but good question. Uh, she asks, is most of the information presented tonight applicable to blood draws as well? That is our issue. My 12 year old daughter faints and then throws up after a blood draw. That's a tough one. Well, I would say it's all, you know, blood draws are a little bit more tricky in terms, there are more things we can do, but they're also more involved procedures. So they usually last a little bit longer and the, it, there's more possibility for fear. There's more um, room to be helped by something like Dr. Lustig's program and exposures. Uh, a lot locally, most of the places that uh, draw um, adults and children regularly have at least one bed where a child can lay down. And blood draws are much more um, amenable to technique. <laughs> so yes. uh, the, the technique of the, of the phlebotomist, the person who's drawing blood really matters in those situations. And, uh, and the experience is gonna impact kids much, much more. It's also a situation where EMLA works really well with, with blood draws which is the cream, right? Yeah, that's the topical cream. You know, you put on, on, your, on your inside elbows. Yeah, and I would say the same. I think, I think 
most of what we're talking about today does apply to someone um, getting a blood draw, particularly the, the person uh, asking that question who sounds like they have a very strong visceral physiological response of, of I think it was fainting and, and throwing up. And so there is a lot that can be done around, around those kinds of things. Um, but it is, as, as Dr. Glinder said, it is more complex. Um, so collaborating with the provider, I think it's essential. Oh boy. So this, this um, parent is giving us some more context. Lidocaine patch was warm, hydrated, had her stuffed animals still passed out and threw up. So, so uh, Dr. Lustig, just briefly, could you speak, for example, to a situation like this? When is a parent, when should a parent seek professional help from somebody like you? Uh, um, it's, I don't have the details of this particular situation. I think, um, again, when, if, if a child has extreme fear that we might call a phobia, that's quite difficult for a parent to, to manage on their own. Um, if the child is, is terrified, even for example, seeing an image of a needle or something like that, um, that can be very difficult. I think it would be hard for a parent um, to treat their own child's phobia. Um, and if there, um, if there's been some trauma, you know, a, a, an actual trauma with needles where the child um, is, um, you know, it has had an extremely negative experience and avoids any, any kind of situation involving needles. And, you know, again, in a more extreme way, that's when people typically you know, will reach out for professional help. If it's just that mild fear that many, many have, I, that can often be manageable at home. So I don't think there's not a clear cut line as to when, um, when to get help. The, the other thing I would say is that um, a lot of the strategies I talked about can be tried at home. And if a child is absolutely resistant, unwilling, or the parent finds that the parent just can't do that with their child um, themselves, they may need to reach out for professional help. I, I would have two simple, uh, just to break it down, I have two simple thresholds. If, if a parent is afraid to talk about vaccinations with their, with their uh, child, then that's a good indicator. You might wanna think about getting some professional help and then if you've had to leave a visit where you were expecting to get vaccines and you can't get them because that whole process went south, your kid, you know, yelled, screamed, hit, spit, fainted, whatever. If that happens twice, if that, if that happens once, consider professional help. If it happens twice, definitely get professional help. All right. Those are both ideas when, when things are, everyone's just too flooded. You just need to detoxify that situation. Exactly. So we have just um, another minute or so together. I want to ask Dr. Larry Capello, who's the board chair at Peninsula Healthcare District, if he has some closing remarks for us. Huge thank you to Dr. Julie Lustig and Dr. Glender for their comments and wisdom today. Really wonderful session. And I'm going to send it back to you, Larry, for a closing comment. I think, Larry, you're on mute. Yes, thank you so much. Um, not just Dr. Lustig and Dr. Glinder and Charlene, uh, but everybody who sat in on this on a Wednesday uh, in the middle of shopping season uh, and uh, vaccination season, we might add. Uh, I think this was a tremendous topic uh, and I really did enjoy uh, all that was said. Um, this was a second uh, this town hall was the second in our series, um, and that we'll, we'll be holding more on the topic of COVID vaccinations. Um, again, uh, Dr. Julie Lustig and Dr. Kellen Glinder, um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to help us and help our community and provide them with the information that I believe a lot of people think about, but sometimes they don't talk about. And it's time to kind of elevate this to a conversation. And I think we did that tonight. So thank you very much. Um, and again, um, Charlene uh, 
And Bev, thank you so much for the work that you are doing with us. I think it's extremely valuable and we want to see it continue. Um, whether you have any questions about COVID, uh, youth health services, or want to know about other health issues, remember the Peninsula Healthcare District is here and we're, we will try to answer any questions you bring to our attention. Again, thank you all so much for being here uh, and I'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Capel and Dr. Lustig. People are asking if you wouldn't mind putting up that resource slide again and everybody who's attending, we will send that out to you in a link. So again, thank you for coming. Take care, everybody. I know this is a busy season. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Special thanks again for Dr. Glender, Dr. Lustig and board chair, Larry Capel. Thank you all. Good night. <music>